you may or may not have seen that there's a video of this presentation has already gone up on InfoQ. So I thought, well, since there is a video of it already, I'm going to completely rewrite it for this, um, which I did on the plane on the way over. So that's not fraught with danger at all. It's going to be completely fine. Uh, the point here is uh, I wanted to demonstrate a building application end-to-end, -end, um, including MongoDB at the back end, obviously, because that's who I work for, um, but a web app from the front end, and try and do that inside 50 minutes to show mostly to dip disprove this idea that Java is kind of slow and boilerplate-y, and you want to do your prototyping in Ruby and then eventually migrate it to the JVM. I kind of wanted to disprove all of that. So it's a fully buzzword compliant application. Uh, I'm doing Angular and HTML5 and JavaScript and all that funky new stuff. Uh, I'm using Bootstrap for the UI. Um, I'm using a library, a really lightweight library called Drop Wizard, which brings together lots of standards and lots of standard libraries to uh, build a web backend in Java. Uh, obviously, MongoDB. I'm uh, using a library called MongoJack to talk to MongoDB, which you'll see a bit more of later. Uh, and then in sort of... Uh, Supporting roles, you'll see Gradle, Groovy, Spock, and, um, and I lean heavily on IntelliJ IDEA to actually do this performance, um, which now I feel very wary about because Dan said earlier that leaning on the ID is a sign of a lot of complexity, which may or may not be the case. And the idea here is, so who's a Java person here? Good. Um, are you doing JavaScript as well or mostly just Java? JavaScript as well? A few of you. So if you're Java people, you might learn a bit about some of AngularJS and web front end stuff. I was very new to this. I haven't done any web development stuff for five or six years. Uh, if you've already done Angular and this sort of thing, then you're probably not going to pick up anything new here. The idea is just to kind of show everything working end to end. Obviously, I don't have time to go into anything in any real depth. Uh, for non-Java people, then I kind of want to demonstrate that Java is not necessarily big and heavy and clunky and clumsy, although you may or may not agree with that conclusion. And obviously, you'll, you'll get an idea of um, using MongoDB to, to prototype rapidly. I mean, one of the ideas of MongoDB is it's really lightweight. It's very easy to get started in your application without having to kind of come up with these massive data schemas uh, up front. And uh, you, I was going to push really strongly about how much you're going to learn to use your IDE, but now I feel really nervous about saying that. So you might learn that if you've got the right tools, you can be very productive if you know how to use those tools, including your IDE. The idea of the app is very simple. The, the app is designed to work on your phone, but it's not an Android app because I, I'm not that um, mental. Uh, what it is is you navigate to a web page. You, it will locate for you your nearest coffee shop. You will place an order for that coffee, and then you will walk into that coffee shop, pick up the coffee, and hopefully drink that coffee. It's quite a simple app. The, the concepts are quite simple. Um, probably someone's already done something like this, but I wanted something which is kind of a, a real-life possible app, not a toy app necessarily, to demonstrate this end-to-end -end functionality. So let's jump straight in because I'm very worried about getting it all done inside 50 minutes. I want to do this in a kind of user story kind of way. So story zero is, as a user of this amazing application, I need to be able to see it. Now that sounds a little bit like story zero, implement app. Um, that's not quite what I meant. It's basically code for, as a developer, I need an app server to deploy this to, and I need kind of infrastructure and framework before I can get going. So let's dive straight in. Can you see that OK in the back? Or do you want me to make it bigger? Hands up if you want it bigger. Loads of you. OK, fine. Is that big enough? Too big. Big enough. Yes? OK. So I'm using Gradle to manage my dependencies. Who's using Gradle? Quite a few of you, not that many. It's OK, so who doesn't know what Gradle is? OK, so Gradle um, kind of, I'm just using it mostly to pull in my dependencies for Java. It's only for the Java side. It's not the front end side. It's just Java. Um, and here I've got two uh, runtime dependencies. So I mentioned I was going to use Drop Wizard. Uh, so that's this one here. And um, MongoJack for talking to MongoDB. The others are testing dependencies. And this is all there is to it for Gradle to kind of get up and running. I can create this into my massive build script if I want it to be a massive build script. 
But out of the box, it just works. And I get a lot of the default targets I expect, like test and run and compile and build and all that sort of thing. So this is a really sort of the, the most skeleton Gradle build file you can have. Um, so that's Gradle. So what I need to do is I'm going to create a service which is going to spin up the back end and, um, and get my app server running. Hang on. This is not, that's a bit better. If people have questions halfway through, then they can ask them, but I may or may not have time or ability to answer them while I'm typing at the same time. But feel free to shout out questions. So this is going to extend a drop wizard service. And now I remember I have not put my glasses on and I can't see anything. Coffee, and this needs, this takes a, a configuration file. So I'm going to give it a coffee shop configuration. But I'm not really going to do anything with this because I have no special configuration for, for, my, um, for my service. I'm going to implement the default methods. I'm going to get IntelliJ to, you can't really see any of this, can you? It's a bit too big. Can you read enough? Or do we want to make it a tiny bit smaller? Silence. A, let, a bit smaller, a tiny bit smaller. Let's try the in-between. OK. It seems to fit on the screen, and it's a bit bigger than it was before. All right, so um, I'm just going to get IntelliJ to fix all my problems for me, which is make this thing, extend this other thing. I don't really need to worry too much about this. The initialization I'll come to in a minute, and the run I'll come to in a minute. This is our main, this is our main application, which is going to run on the back end, so it needs a public static void main method. That's a default shortcut which comes with IntelliJ, so I didn't have to do loads of typing. It just works. Uh, I'm going to have a new coffee shop service dot run. It's going to take my args. I'm going to tell it to deal with exceptions the way it knows how. Implement the run method. Um, add resource. I typed coffee shop a lot of times when I was creating this. And this is going to be my, um, my web resource, my web services resource. So um, are people using RESTful web services? OK, there's some nods around the room. So this is my RESTful web service. For more information, you can read the web services, web, is it Jim Weber? The web, web services book. Um, but I'm going to tell it that it's my uh, root of the app by saying the path is going to be slash coffee shop. I care about um, uh, consuming and creating JSON. I'm not going to do much with this right now. I will definitely come to this later. But I need one of those to get my application up and running. Now, if I try and run this, it should fail for the correct reason, which will be I haven't given it enough initialization yet. So I need to tell it what I'm trying to run as a server. Oops, which I've spelt badly. Now, when I run that, it shouldn't error. What we should see, oh, no, I've put you into the, so we should see a 404. So that means at least I have a web server up and running, super easy peasy. Uh, I don't have this coffee HTML file yet, so I'm getting a 404. Now, one of the things I really like about this is uh, Drop Wizard uses Jetty as its web server, and it's like super lightweight and super fast. And I hadn't used it before, and I find this really nice, especially for development, because the startup time is like a second or two. Uh, and that just comes, now I've done this as part of Drop Wizard, it just does all of that for me. So it just gets out the way and I don't have to worry about it too much. Now what I want to do is I need to serve my static uh, coffee HTML file. Uh, let's call this something useful. And I need to tell it that I'm going to serve static content as well as my Java for dealing with my web resources. So I need to have a configuration file. And I need to cheat. I just got a quick cheat in there, because otherwise I'll type it wrong, which says that anything I post or get from uh, the slash URL, uh, the URL with slash service in it, I want that to go to my Java stuff. I want that to go to, ultimately, um, coffee shop resource. OK, so that's how I point all of that stuff over there. 
And then what I want to do is I want to say I want to serve a static HTML as well. So that was a bit of a cheat as well, because all this typing would be too boring. Um, so here I say I'm going to initialize my um, application with this bundle. Slash HTML is where my HTML is. It's in resources slash HTML. And uh, so anything that just goes straight to the, the root of the, of the application, I want it to serve static HTML content for that. So what you should see when I do that is if I restart the server, there's an awful lot of shoulds and hopefully and woulds when you're doing this uh, live demo thing. or it could totally not work. What did I not do? Oh, I remember. It's the same thing I always do wrong. But you need to tell it where to find the configuration file. So it needs to have config, no, what was it called? Coffee.yaml. So now when I restart that, yay. No more 404, and from the title in the top, we know we're serving the correct page. OK, so that was kind of the, the necessary evil of setup. Now, when I've started projects in the past, I've always found that getting everything up and running, getting a web server, getting the, the, the glue to get everything to work is quite tedious. But I've just found that with DropWizard, it's not that difficult. It's just a few lines of code, and everything's kind of glued together and ready for me to start implementing the more interesting stuff in my application. So story one, as a coffee drinker, I would like to be able to select the coffee I want to order, because otherwise, what's the point? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a drop down on here, which is the type of coffee I can order. And I'm going to do this in, in the Angular. So let's get rid of the stuff we don't need. That means I'm going to make this into an Angular app. Oops, I couldn't put that in the wrong place. And I need to include Angular. This is a shortcut that IntelliJ comes with, so I, I don't have to type everything. And it also really nicely does um, autocomplete on my includes as well, which I, when I was doing web development about five years ago, everything was just typing, right? And, and now a lot of this is automated, so you make a lot less, a lot fewer errors. So the other thing I need is I need my own JavaScript file, uh, which I'm going to call, surprisingly, coffee. I need to create one of those. I need to tell it it's an Angular module. Um, this is another shortcut that comes with IntelliJ. Coffee app. And I get my the things I'd expect as a Java programmer. I can extract this as a variable, um, even though it's JavaScript. Like, this is probably not news to some of you, but for me, it was really nice to be able to use a proper IDE for doing JavaScript development, because I always did it in Notepad before. Right, so I've, I've created my application. I have included it in my HTML page. I need, a, um, I need the list of drinks to select from, so I want to be able to select a cappuccino or a latte or whatever, which means I need a controller for this. So this is uh, NGM. Like, loads of this Angular stuff is just uh, built into the Angular plugin for IntelliJ. And, and that is not built into IntelliJ. So I've just got a, uh, an array of the different types of coffees that you might be able to order. Um, for now, I'm using a hard-coded array, but you can imagine over time you might, um, you might refactor this to be something that you pull out of a database or from a file or, or from another web service, something like that. So now I need to actually have this in here. So I need in a div. Uh, this needs to be an ng controller, because I, I said there was a controller. I need to call this, look, and again, I get my nice autocomplete. So I need to call it the same thing it was called in my uh, JavaScript file. Um, I'm going to have I've got a slight shortcut just for creating this div with a form group, so my form elements are separated. Uh, I'm going to call this um, type of coffee. And I'm going to create a drop down, uh, an Angular drop down populated with the data from, from Angular. So this is going to be drink.type. This is going to be type.name 
for type in types. Um, so here, my array is called types, um, and these are objects, JavaScript objects, lightweight objects. So they've got a name and a family. So we've got coffee, coffee, the other thing that's not coffee. And I only want to display in the drop down. I just want to display the name. So for that, I just say type.name, just show me type.name for every type in there. So I'm going to iterate over that. And hopefully, yes. So now we have our type. We've got a drop down, which has got the same values from the array list. And I can do things that you'd expect to be able to do. So I want to be able to reorder this alphabetically, because it's just coming in the order it came from the list, because lists are, by default, ordered. Um, so I'm going to do that by saying um, order by name. Oops, wait for it to. There we go, so A, C, L, T. Great, so that's kind of the really simple stuff of using Angular to get stuff from some sort of data source, in this case an array, and just shoving it onto the screen. That's story one. But as the coffee shop, I need to know what size you wanted, because it's all well and good saying cappuccino, but which size did you want? But I also want to know your name, so I don't just hand it out to someone randomly. So it's the same sort of thing here. There's no real magic here. I just want to build up something which is more useful. So here I've got um, an array of sizes, small, medium, large. These are simple. These are just strings. They're not objects. And uh, similarly here I have, that was an IntelliJ cheat. Um, for another drop down for size, here I just need to do size for size in sizes because I'm not pulling out a specific value off the object. So that's easy. And then in here, I'm going to have a name as well. So label your name. And drink dot drinker. So that's you. I'm going to make this a required field so that you know, you can pick up the correct drink in the coffee shop. Um, and then I'm going to reload that. So now we've got type, and we've got size, and I can put my name in here. So that's all great, but I promised you Angular and HTML and modern web application development. And so far, you've seen something which looks a little bit like the stuff I was doing in 1997. Um, it's not terribly pretty. So this is where Bootstrap comes in. So Bootstrap is a really nice uh, CSS library from Twitter, I think. Um, and it's, it's just really, really awesome. So I'm going to include this in here, Bootstrap CSS. I've already slightly cheated because I put the correct class names on here anyway. So I've got container and form group. I've got form control. So that was a tiny bit of a cheat. The other thing I need is the magic incantation for making it friendly on phones, which I won't pretend to understand, but it works. You can see I'm not a web developer, right? So then when I've done that, I get, magically, something which kind of looks like it's a bit more polished. And the nice thing is, do people use the web development tools in Chrome? Yeah. I don't know how we, how we did web development without it before. But there's also a cool kind of thing here. You can do an emulation mode for your mobile phone. I'm emulating on the Nexus 5. So you can't really see it very well, but get, you get the idea of how much space it's going to take up on the screen. So you can even you know, do that in mobile type mode. But we're not going to use that because no one can see that. Um, so the bit that I always found quite painful about web development, this idea of trying to apply CSS in a useful way, which will lay it out in a pretty fashion, um, took like uh, almost zero time at all. Sorry, I was doing story three. Um, <laughs> It didn't take very long to get something that was a very basic thing looking a bit more polished. And you can imagine that you can iterate over this and make it more custom to you. But you don't have to spend ages learning CSS and wondering what a div is supposed to be. And that's it. Oops. Now I've done that. I've got a screen, but I actually need to be able to send it, send the order to the shop. This is where we start doing the interesting bit of tying up the, the web front end stuff to the, the, the Java back end using REST and JSON and all those buzzword compliant things. So obviously, we need an input button. And this one is going to be called Give Me Coffee. The more exclamation marks is the more you need uh, the caffeine. Uh, these are classes that come from Bootstrap. I'm just going to make this button even bigger. So I'm going to make it a large button. 
Uh, I'm going to put this inside a form, which shouldn't come as a shock to anyone. Uh, I'm going to put it in an Angular form. It's got an ng submit on it. And this is going to call give me coffee. Now, before we go much further with this, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have a look at the data I'm going to submit to the back end. So this is more for debug purposes than anything else. Um, but if I output this drink object, so you see I've got here drink.type, drink.size, drink.drinker. So there's, there's this idea of a drink object. I'm going to output that in JSON style on the screen. We've got a big button. And then as I add things there, I can see my JSON object. So I've got, I've got my object, which is the drink type. I've got the string value for size, string value for, for me, who I am. So this is the thing. This is the JSON that's going to get submitted to the back end when I press this button. So let's implement give me coffee. In my JavaScript, I need uh, scope.give me coffee. Is it new function or function? And then this is going to be, this is where I get a complete blank. Uh, coffee order dot save. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give it, in real life, or in a further later iteration, it's going to need the idea of the coffee shop that it's going to go to, but we haven't done that yet. We've just said this is the order. So I'm going to hard code an ID for the time being. Uh, the scope.drink, which is the thing we printed out to the, to the screen, that needs to be submitted. Now this coffee order is going to be, so I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on Angular or Angular best practices at all, because I'm not. And, I learned this in uh, about a week or so, but that's kind of the point. You can get up and running in this fairly quickly without having to learn everything about JavaScript, HTML, and the web. Um, so, ngmfa. Oh. So, IntelliJ does actually provide lots of useful shortcuts, but then you have to remember what they are. Coffee order. This is going to use resource, which I'm going to go to in a minute, and this is going to do. OK, so this is going to take this drink object with this coffee shop ID. It's going to post it to slash service, which we said was the URL for the, the Java classes, slash coffee shop, because in my resource, it's called slash coffee shop. Um, the ID is the coffee shop ID. And I'm going to post the order object off to that URL. This resource here, I need to include another um, module from Angular to use that and the resources to do the web resources. And so I need to include that in here as well. Script source. And then in theory, in theory, if I if I try and post this order that we created here, well, let's reload it because that's all a load of changes. What we should see down in the resources is we, in the network resources, you can't really see the text very well, but you should see it trying to hit that URL. So here's my order. OK, so we're going to order coffee shop service, and we get a 404, which is the correct error because we haven't implemented it yet. So let's go to the back end. And let's do a tiny, tiny cheat magically get what I want. So this is, the, this is the URL that I said I was doing. The ID is the coffee shop ID. So path param ID, coffee shop ID. Um, we're going to post it, and we're expecting JSON. And the, the drink object that was on the, on the UI is going to be an order object on the back end. Uh, save order. Um, and then when it's successfully done, I'm going to create a res I'm going to return a response of created, which is a 201. Uh, and so I have to create the URI. And this is going to be the ID of the order. So later on, if I want to, I can get that order. Um, and I'm going to post the contents of the order so that the, the, the UI can look at it and do useful stuff with it. So let's create this order class here. Let's get IntelliJ to create this for me. So what's this? this has created me in a string ID on the order. I need a magic incantation to tell MongoJack that this is an ID for MongoDB. 
So when you say something into MongoDB without an ID, by default, it will generate you an object ID. Now, I want to treat that as a string. I don't want to treat it as um, a MongoDB object ID um, class because I don't want that leaking all over my domain. I just want to treat it as a string. So I need this magic incantation to say, turning it, turn it into an object ID when it goes into the database. And I need this to tell MongoJack that this is the unique identifier for this object. So let's build up this object as we go. So I want to set this coffee shop ID on the order. Set coffee shop ID. So that's created me a, a coffee shop ID field. The other thing is, what else are we missing? So here, this is the JSON that I'm expecting to see posted back to the back end. So I, I want my order object to look a little bit like that. So let's just paste that in there so that I know what it looks like. So we remember that this type is an object in its own right. So I'm going to create a private drink type type. Here, just to make things as easy as possible, I'm going to map the field names to be exactly the same as the, the name that comes in off the JSON. You don't have to. You could say it's going to be called something different if you want to. But for simplicity, it just magically maps this to this. Uh, and I'll come to that in a minute. Private string size and private. I'm going to need this later on. Uh, selected options. Um, that's, yeah, I'll come to that later on and a private string of drinker. Not that Trisha is a drinker at all. No, no, no. So let's create this drink type. No. Create class drink type. And the drink type had a name and a family. And that's all we need on drink type. But because this is Java, we also need getters. And we need a equals and hash code. This is mostly for tests, because I'm going to do comparisons in the test. And we need a two string, so that when my test fails, I can see what the object looks like. So I don't know what they mean when they say Java's verbose. I, I really, I think it's fine. There's nothing wrong with this class with two fields in it. It's totally fine. What's that? The setters. The setters. I don't need the setters for this. Um, so the MongoJack will use the getters to figure out which fields to serialize and deserialize, either into, well, Jackson will do it for the JSON side, and MongoJack will do it for this, putting it into MongoDB. You can use setters as well, especially if you're going to play with the names. And um, I would also have, yeah, I'd make these immutable and have a constructor with all the things in. But to get the absolute bare minimum working, this is all you need. So if you're doing some rapid prototyping, you're not quite sure of the shape of your, um, of your objects yet, all you need is the fields and the getters, and it will just do all that for you. So well, let's go back to my order, because we'll, we'll also need all the, um, all the getters for the order. Why do I have a constructor? I don't need one of those. So I need all my getters for these. Um, I'm not going to put equals and hash code and stuff, because I, I don't need those for the, the test. I, I needed them only for the test. So what we want to do, though, of course, is the meat of this. We want to save this into MongoDB. I've received an order from the customer. Um, it's been serialized magically from JSON into my order type, which is nice. I've just got domain objects to deal with. I don't have to deal with the glue of saying, get this field, get this field, get this field. It's just taken care of. But I do want to save that into MongoDB. So I'm going to save it into my database. Oh, come on, IntelliJ. Don't fail me now. Um, I want to have that's final because it's a good thing to do. Um, MongoDB has this idea of, um, so it's a NoSQL database, it's a document database, it stores stuff in a JSON type way, not in tables and columns and rows and things like that. Um, so instead of having tables, we have collections. So I'm going to get my orders collection. Uh, which I might actually have called order, now I think about it. 
I'm not sure. We'll see. The test will tell me if I've done it wrong. Uh, and in order to get Mongo Jack to magically turn my order object into something that MongoDB understands, I need to create a uh, Jackson DB collection. Uh, I'm going to wrap this underlying orders collection. I'm going to give it the type that needs transforming. So I, I'm storing orders. So I need to give it an order.class because Java's a bit twitchy about generics, for example. Uh, I'm going to give it the, uh, the type of the ID because I'm storing it as a string, not as an object ID. So I'm going to give that the type of the ID as well. So then I end up with a collection oh, which is typed with order and string. And then it's as simple as collection.insert order. And it just does it. It just saves it into the database for you. So obviously, I'm going to have to do some sort of error handling, maybe. So let's do some simple, basic error handling, just um, because it's a good thing to do. And of course, as your application matures, you can add more complex error handling for different error cases. But if it's null, I want to return uh, response dot, let's call it server error, which isn't quite right, because that's a 500. And if it's, it should perhaps be a different error. But that will do for now. If it's successful, what I need to do is um, Mongo will have allocated me a unique ID for this order. So I need to set my ID. Um, and this is going to come back on the right result. So get saved ID. And this will come back as a string, because I told it it was a string type. Now, in theory, that's all I need to do. But because. What's that? Uh, yes, I did that last time and wondered why I kept getting server errors. Thank you. And that's why you pair with people, because people are idiots. Me, not you lot, obviously. You're <laughs> obviously much smarter than me. <laughs> but you can't see when you're that close. So I've written a, a Spock test. Anyone, does anyone know what Spock is? Anyone not know what Spock is? Spock is amazing. And if you're doing unit testing or acceptance testing, I definitely have a look at Spock. It is written in Groovy, which made me a bit like, oh, I don't want to write Groovy code because like, I write Java and I don't need Groovy code. But um, it's, much more, um, it's much more descriptive. So here, um, I want to do this. So my test is, should give me back the order ID when an order is successfully created. And this is a string. And I've got a given, a when, and a then. And, um, and it's just much more descriptive what's going on. It kind of forces you to think about what is set up, uh, what is, what's the thing you're actually testing, and then what are your assertions. Um, and it also makes mocking like really ridiculously easy. So we, we're switching all of our unit tests to Spock, even though we're, we're supposed to be writing just Java for the Java, uh, Java driver for MongoDB. So let's run this and see what I've done wrong, because I will definitely have done something wrong, as always. Because um, I don't want to start up the server and then do UI stuff to find out I did something wrong. The unit test will show me much sooner what I did wrong. So here, um, I changed the signature so it takes a database, but I didn't say how to initialize the Mongo database. Now I'm going to run my, um, I'm running my Mongo on, on defaults. So by default, Mongo client is localhost on 27.0 something something. Um, so I don't, I'm not going to define those because I've already got them, but I could pass in. Uh, the host or the address of where the server is. It's super easy. And then I just need to get the database from there. So Mongo client, get database. Uh, Trisha, coffee. And pass that in. Now, my test should pass. Downside of Spock, it's a little bit slower than using unit tests. Uh, J unit, unit tests. Right, so that went green, yes. I love green tests. They just give me validation of my existence. That's not really true. That would be quite sad if that was true. So I have a functional test as well. That was just a unit test. So I had some mocks mocking out the database. Now I want a functional test just to provide that extra step of safety to make sure I'm saving all the fields I think I'm saving into the database, which means I need to spin up my MongoDB instance. And in order to do that, I just need to start MongoDB. That's it. It's running. Uh, let's have a quick look at it at the moment. So if I do show DBs, um, 
Oh, no. I've already got a coffee. Let's get rid of that. So let's clear that. Let's create a new one. Oops. Let's start that back up again. How puzzling. Let's drop that. Drop. Yeah, it's either drop database or drop DB. Yeah. So now we should see that we, we don't have, well, you can't really see that very well, but can I change this font size on that? It says some database, admin and local. So there's like no databases in there at the moment. Uh, so if we run this functional test, and we're inserting this into Trisha Coffee, the database, and the collection of orders. And it went green, first time, that's amazing. Did not expect that. Uh, so then if we go here and we should do show DBs, it's created Trisha Coffee, so we're gonna use Trisha Coffee. And we're gonna do db.orders.find. Display it in a pretty way. Um, you can't really see the shape of that very well, but we've got this generated object ID, which MongoDB gave us. We have this um, embedded document, which is the drink type with a name and the family. We've got a simple field, which is the size of medium. We have an array in here, which is the selected options, in this case, soy milk. We've got the drinker, and then we've got a coffee shop ID as well. So it's just basically JSON-ish data stored in MongoDB. Now, if we, where was I? If we restart our web server, We should pick up our new method. We've created a new method, so we need to do a restart. It's just not going to hot deploy that. In theory, now when we post this, we shouldn't get the 404. OK, so what we've got down here is we've got 201 created. And if I look here, can I change the size of this? View. Bigger. Is that a bit better? So now if we do find, we've got two. We've got the one that was created um, by the test, and we've got the one which I created from the web page. And they're not exactly the same size, same shape, because this thing's got an array in it, and this thing doesn't have an array in it, and that's totally fine. Mongo doesn't care about that, which is why it's quite good for prototyping and, and rapid development, because you can just chuck stuff in there of any shape, and it's like, that's totally fine. It's just up to you how you get that data back and how you parse it. Uh, what time is it? I've got 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Cool. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? We are saving stuff into the database. And I've got 10 minutes left. So that's quite good. But we want to do some good stuff. We've heard a few things about DevOps um, and about the responsibility of developers to try and make things as easy as possible in the transition to production, for example. One of the things you don't really want is um, your production web server running out of memory or connections or just basically falling over for whatever reason. So you need to make sure that you close all your Mongo connections when your web server shuts down. And Drop Wizard makes it really easy to manage things like this, manage the life cycle of this stuff as well. So all we need to do to be a responsible developer is in our coffee shop service where we created our Mongo client, we need to add a new managed resource. I don't know why it's asking me about Git. I didn't even know I had Git on here. Uh, create a field for this, blah, blah, blah. I only need managed. I'm going to implement all my methods from here. On MongoDB, I don't care about what happens on start. Maybe I might want to do something like make a test connection and make sure it's there and everything's fine. But for this purpose, I don't, need to, I don't care about that at the moment. But on stop, what I do need to do is I need to close all my connections when we stop the web server. And it's as simple as that. And now I just need to restart my, my web server. And um, just make sure everything still works the same way it's supposed to. And we 
can see in here, that worked. So that's great. And we've, we were responsible developers, and it took us like zero effort. Now, one of the things you don't really want users doing is checking the Google Chrome network window to make sure that their order got sent, right? So you want to give some sort of feedback saying, yes, your order was received. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to use uh, some widgets from UI Bootstrap to do this for us. So this UI Bootstrap is kind of cool. It uses some Angular stuff and some Bootstrap stuff to give you some nice, pretty widgets that are reusable, and you can, you can do cool stuff with them without you having to write everything from scratch. Now, now I just have to remember how to do that. So let's have ourselves a new array called messages. It's got nothing in it at the moment. What we want to do is, on this coffeeorder.save, there are some extra parameters we can put in here. So I can put in a success uh, callback. So I'm going to say, uh, here's one I prepared earlier. Oh, no, you guys didn't get that in this country. Never mind. Um, so when I, when I get a successful save, then I'm on to this messages array, I'm going to push a message of type success with an, a message of order sent. Now, you could do all sorts of stuff with this. So for example, I was sending back the order ID and the whole order object. So if you wanted to, you could display the details of the order in the success message. You could link back to the original order, stuff like that. But for the simple thing, I'm just going to say, yeah, I got it. Everything was fine. And then I'm going to put in here. Um, a shortcut I can't remember. Oh, look at that. Message. Uh, so yes, that was another cheat, not an IntelliJ reading my mind moment. Uh, so here I'm using um, this alert reusable thing to read everything in that messages array and to display it in some useful way. I also need a way to close that. So I need a close uh, alert, um, which will close that down. Uh, and this is using UI Bootstrap, so I need to add this to my modules, UI.Bootstrap. And in here, I need to add UI Bootstrap, uh, JS, UI Bootstrap. Um, and then it should work. So now I get a nice green, that is green, right? I'm red, green, colorblind, so I can't tell the difference. But you get a nice green alert at the top saying, yeah, your order was sent. And you could put things in there like a link to the order. Um, and you can close that down. And the other thing you could do, of course, is I added a success message. But the next parameter in would be a, uh, a failure message. So if something went wrong, I could display an alert saying, I couldn't find the server, or your order is ridiculous, and there's no way we're going to fulfill that. Um, there's a couple of other extra things I wanted to cover, but um, I don't think we've got time. So this, in the back end, I added this array for selected options. So you could kind of freeform add like soy milk and caramel and decaf. And I mean, who wants decaf coffee? That's ridiculous. Um, and to be able to freeform add stuff as well. And I wanted to show that you can add that and just put them into MongoDB without MongoDB knowing what those values are. And it's totally fine. Uh, you'll just have to take my word for it, because I think I don't have time to do that. But what I did want to show is um, I need to know where to pick this coffee up from. I said we were going to order it from our nearest coffee shop. But I haven't done anything about nearest coffee shop. And I've hard coded a coffee shop ID, so it has no idea where it's going. So I'm going to use some of Mongo's um, geolocation uh, uh, yeah, geo features to show you how geo stuff works with Mongo. And it's just kind of, um, it just kind of comes out of the box, if you like. So enough talk. What we want to do is we want to, right, firstly, I have a Groovy script. Well, that's not firstly. Firstly, I used, oh, that was a bad idea. That's just going to take forever. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, OpenStreetMap data. I downloaded a bunch of OpenStreetMap data in XML form, uh, which has got the amenity of, uh, no, sorry, the cuisine of coffee shop. So anything which has a cuisine of coffee shop, I've downloaded it in this XML file. It's, it's not comprehensive, but it's, it's a good indication anyway. Um, but this XML is not in the form that MongoDB needs it in. Firstly, it's in XML, not in JSON. And secondly, it has the latitude and longitude of the points as attributes on the XML. And I need those in GeoJSON form before I can put it into MongoDB. Because what I want is a list of all the coffee shops, obviously, in MongoDB. So I wrote a Groovy script to do this because Groovy is my new favorite toy. Um, and 
I also want to show that with Groovy, you can connect directly to MongoDB using the Java driver, the same way you do in Java without any problems. Um, I'm going to read this coffee shop resources file. I'm going to go through each of these XML nodes. The XML stuff in Groovy is really, really awesome. If you've done XML stuff in Java, it's painful. And in Groovy, it's, it's intuitive. Um, so I want to pick out the, um, the latitude and longitude from the XML, and I want to put it into this format, which is the GeoJSON format. Um, and then if it's got a name, then um, if it's got a name and it's valid, then I'm going to put it into MongoDB. So I'm just going to run this. There's a few of them. I've got 808734. So now I want to do in here uh, db.coffeeshop.count. I've now got 8,734 coffee shops in here. So if we want to do, let's have a look at one of these. So now we can see it's in kind of um, JSON form, and I've put it in a GeoJSON location. OK, and there's like loads of those. So what I want to do is I want to be able to return. I want to give you, I want to give MongoDB my current location, which is here, and for it to return the number one closest coffee shop to that point. So let's do that in here. We're going to do this as a get because we want to get our nearest location. So tiny, tiny cheat there. Uh, get nearest. Returns an object. Um, and another tiny, tiny cheat because I knew I was going to run out of time. So we're going to do the, we're not using MongoJack here. We don't need to use MongoJack. We just use the raw Java driver. I'm going to use the coffee shop collection. Um, and then I'm going to create this query. Let's put this down here so we can see it. So query builder, using the location field, because that's where the location is, um, I'm going to give it my current latitude and longitude and say, find me the closest one within two kilometers. And that's hopefully going to find us our nearest coffee shop. And if it doesn't find one, I'm going to get a 404, because that's the right error to throw. Let's test that we've got this right. So Chicago. When I ran this, rather sadly, the nearest coffee shop turns out to be Starbucks, which didn't really narrow it down. And that went green, so that's kind of working. So I, I can at least redeploy that and see if I can get it working on the, on the web server. What's, how are we doing for time? Three minutes. <laughs> it's a race against the clock. Um, and I don't know which, what I'm looking for. Um, Right, so our previous controller was for ordering coffee. We're going to have a new controller for coffee shops, coffee shops, which I happen to have created earlier. Um, and I'm not an expert on Angular, so I don't know if that's all best practice, but I do know that it does work. And what we want here is the coffee shop locator, because that's what I pass in here, oh, there. And I need resource and um, not that and here I'm going to do the get to the to the method I just created on the server and then finally I need a button to call that um, which I can't remember what it's called I was doing so well. Right, uh, which I called find my coffee. OK, so this is another div which uses the coffee shop control I just created. It happens to have a button in it, which has got find my coffee shop. And this will fire off the, the call to find coffee shop nearest to me. Now, I have to turn the Wi-Fi on, which means I'll probably get 30,000 tweet messages when I turn that on. Please don't tweet anything. And uh, when I press find my coffee shop, yes, Starbucks is my nearest coffee shop. I've created a massive hack to try and show it onto Google, which is you, you pass in the name and the, the location, and it, it will perhaps show it to you. I didn't want to do a whole embedding Google Maps into the thing, because that's not what this talk is all about. And apparently, the conference Wi-Fi is just not having any of it. But take my word for it, that is the Starbucks closest to this hotel. <laughs> um, 
And that is my web app built in under an hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>